Good afternoon from the Zero Project Conference. I'm very honored to have a splendid gentleman uh, next to me, uh, David Baines. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, David, you, are, have, you wear a number of hats, and, uh, and, uh, and one of them uh, to be a Zero Project MOD because um, you are amongst the 76 uh, which we are celebrating during, during this conference. Uh, we charge on innovation, impact, and, uh, and scalability. And uh, you are one of the 76 which has gone you know, through the nomination process, then we have a three-phase evaluation process. And uh, at the end, Global Symbols is one of the, is one of the FODs. Um, I know you, you know half of the people, at least. Uh, but for the other half, please introduce yourself briefly. Uh, thank you, Ulrich. Yeah, I, my, I'm David. I'm with my uh, colleague, uh, E.A. Drappen. Uh, we built and developed Global Symbols. So my interest really is how do we support people with no speech, with no voice, to communicate regardless of where they are, but in a language and using symbols that reflect their interests. So I've been working in disability and technology for about 35 years. But this interest in communication has been at the heart of many of those years. How did you come up with the idea of, of global symbols? It started when I was working in Qatar. Uh, so we were working and we were really interested in how you developed a symbol set that reflected Arabic language and culture. Because although there were many symbol sets available, and they were very good, there were symbols that differed for how people communicated, symbols for how people dressed, the food they ate, uh, even things like how houses were designed, um, and even how you represented family and friends, men and women, were quite important to be familiar to people. So we developed a symbol set for Arabic to start off with, and it then became very clear that, that was really just the beginning of a process. So with global symbols, what we wanted to do was to say not that symbols are universal, but that many symbols need to reflect the experience of people who are using them. So by working with countries, with communities, you build a set of open symbol resources for communication that are most familiar and are owned by the people that are going to use them. And that means that actually there's much more chance of success in communication because of that familiarity. So that's where we came from and why we decided to do it. And who, who is the, uh, or which, uh, which group uh, is the target group initially and then um, maybe it developed into a, into a broader spectrum? So we definitely started um, with children and adults without speech. So where communication was a, a barrier because speech was in unintelligible or just very difficult to do, we wanted to put together an, a, a package of resources that were both low-tech and high-tech because not everybody has access to phones and tablets all the time. So our for initial audience were people, for instance, there were young people with cerebral palsy, where because of physical needs, speech was unintelligible. Um, we also then had people who with uh, autism, where communication was difficult. So we had this mixture of physical needs, speech impairment, communication needs which can be described in all sorts of different ways, but at the heart of that was this idea of communication. I wanted to communicate, I want to have a voice, but the way in which other people communicate isn't right for me. How does Global Symbols work? Is it a, a, a device? Is it stones? Is it a tablet? Or wh what is it? It can be all of those. That's the great thing. So Global Symbols is uh, a repository of symbols that people have designed from different parts of the world. Uh, and the really nice thing is that uh, they're open symbols. So anyone can take and use the symbols that we've made available and use them within their community. So the Arabic symbols are there. Uh, there are symbols from India. There are Spanish symbols. Uh, the symbols that we developed uh, in uh, Serbia, Croatia, and Montenegro. Um, and there's plenty of scope for more there. So the first thing is the repository. The second thing we did is we linked that up to what we call Board Builder. Now, Board Builder is a really simple idea, which is how do you create communication boards which combine symbols together for people to talk and chat and discuss? 
And we wanted a system that, yes, you could use it by having it as a web page on a tablet. But we were working with people in places like Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Kenya, where actually what they most needed was a very low-tech system. So what we made allowed this to do was to output the boards for communication, print them, put them in binders so that people could communicate. But exactly the same output could go into an app or it could go into a web page. It could be spoken out loud. So we wanted that consistency of communication in place. And that's one of the things that we, we were trying really hard to do was to allow people to choose the point at which they use the symbols. And by doing it in that way, we've then been able to link up with other people who are doing really interesting things, such as the Pixie Pal, which is a low-tech case for symbol communication. And we can put those things together to create a system that people can use. In which way is Global sim Symbols innovative? What, uh, what is revolutionary about it? I think there's, there's a couple of things. Um, one is, I, I think, when we talk about innovation, really focusing on an open approach at every step of the st process. Now, this doesn't mean to say that everything is free for everyone all the time, but it does mean that everything that we do and we deliver can be taken by others, it can be customized, translated, shared, used, and reused. People can adapt and modify things. So our training materials, UNICEF funded us to build a training course. Those training materials anyone can take and translate into their own language. They can change parts of it. It may be that the photos, maybe from Spain, aren't quite right for Nairobi. They're not, people would like things that look familiar. So we want to try and make those so that people can adjust and adapt them. So that's the first innovation, is that you can take the uh, vanilla content, if you like, mm -hmm. and make it relevant to you. And there's no charge for that. In fact, we'll even host it for you and make it available to other people uh, like you. But the second thing I think which is really important in terms of the innovation is the move to democratizing the process. So that when we design symbols, we have this thing called symbol creator, where you can adapt and design new symbols for people to use. And we didn't want that just to be a consultation process. We wanted the stakeholders to actually determine themselves what those symbols would look like. And I think one of the things that we've tried very hard to do with people who use augmentative and alternative communication is to put them at the forefront of that decision making. We say nothing about us without us. And in this case, we're saying actually, without you, we're not going to do it. It's as simple as that. Very true. Uh, this sounds also like a lot of, uh, of community work, community tools. How, how do you bring the people together? Is this also one of the intentions to to exchange the symbols and, uh, and yes. Uh, yes. So we really encourage people that when they adapt symbols, when they build boards, they put them back into the repository for other people to use. And that constant reuse of, of what people have created makes it much, much faster for others to develop what they need. It might be there might be a board. We designed boards for COVID, for people who are experiencing COVID to describe the pain and the condition the con and the services they were receiving. But it might be that one or two of those things are different for one person to another. Let's not start from scratch. Let's just say, okay, those two symbols, a symbol for hospital, or for instance, it might be that you have a red cross for emergency in one, but it's the red crescent in another part of the world. Just change that one symbol. That's all you need to do. Uh, David, this was, uh, let's say, about the content, uh, but it's also a startup. Uh, in what stage of business uh, development are you, are you in? Um, I think evolving is the, is the correct, okay. correct word. We have, we have a very simple business model. Um, so the first thing is that we, we raise enough money each year to maintain the service. That's our first year, and that's not actually that expensive. We, we do that through patronage grants and so on. So around about six, seven thousand pounds a year will give us that baseline. What we then do is have a, a series of development projects each year. And the money from those development projects allows the, uh, pro the, the, the project to grow wider and wider. But because the way we're built is we don't have to be at the core of everything that it does. If you're in a country and you want to do it, you want to share it back with us, we don't need funding to do that. So it's quite a mature model, but it's quite a different model. 
it's always very interesting, especially for startups in the in, in the development, also the, the mistakes you have made. So, which was the big one? The big oh, where do I start? I think the big the, the biggest mistake we made is we were uh, was actually trying to scope out projects and pieces of work. Um, and whilst we accurately scoped out how much time it would take us to do what was in the scope, uh, we were very, very bad at saying no to uh, expanding that scope and suddenly realising we had committed ourselves to quite a lot of extra work without any funding to support it. Uh, that wasn't unusual. Um, so not being able to say no was probably our biggest mistake. Um, but that's also been part it's of the fun. A nice one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it means we've done things otherwise we wouldn't have done. Right. And the success, but uh, about the other things which you got surely right, which really went according to plan. I think the thing that we, we absolutely feel we got right was from the beginning we knew that it wasn't just about the technology. At the heart of the, of the success is people's involvement with the technology. It's about providing training, it's about providing support, raising awareness. When you put all those elements of the ecosystem together, the environment for the technology is fertile. It can take roots, it can grow. So you put those things in place, you bring in the technology that people need, you build an open approach, and when you put all those things to do, you then come back and you evaluate. And I think the thing which we're most proud of is the, the evaluation of the work we did with UNICEF, with Seaboard in Serbia, Croatia, and Montenegro. The results said the difference you have made, and we have made, for the children we're working with has been immense. And it's that wonderful. was important. That's great. Wishes for the future. What, uh, where do you see Global Symbols in, uh, in a couple of years? Partners. It's got to be, it's not about Global Symbols alone. It's about Global Symbols working in partnership with all sorts of other organizations. I think communication is a human right. And if you're going to take this as a rights-based approach, no one organisation, whether they are charity, whether they are government, whether they are the private sector, can do this alone. So that idea of collaboration, cooperation and working together to take the agenda forward is the most critical one. And that's why we're so pleased. I'm so proud of being an awardee here at the Zero Project, because here we can give voice to that need for collaboration. And that's what the most important thing for us going forward. Thank you, David. It's always good to talk to you and to, to listen to you above all. Uh, we are not alone here in the, in the studio live from the Zero Project Conference. Uh, we have Petra Plitschka with us, who is doing a graphic facilitation. And I hand over to her because she's going to summarize our little interview. Petra, please. What are global symbols? They make a difference in the lives of people who do not have speech. For instance, um, it's, it's an international set of global symbols and the person, for the first time maybe in their life, um, help can understand things. And the person also gets a voice, so he or she can speak using these international symbols. We heard that the symbols um, derived from the Arabic language, but have been transformed into many, many other languages. And Wilfried's question was, um, what are the innovations within this project? And I heard two things. First of all, you have a very open approach. Doesn't mean it's free for everyone, but it's open. So once you have your set of symbols, you and you have some learning materials, for instance, you can just change some of the icons. Red cross versus the red moon, if, if that's uh, relevant for your culture or your language. So it's very open, you can adapt it, you can change it to the needs of your clients, of your people, the people you work for and work with. And the second one is it's a democratized process. So it's nothing about us without us. So you involve the experts uh, on easy language and on symbols and develop things that are low tech, papers, I guess, you can print it out, you can use it, but also high tech. And in both versions, you build boards for communication. So um, what are some wishes for the future? Or what is also driving you into the future? Collaboration and cooperation and making the difference in people's lives. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Petra. Uh, David, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, we are broadcasting live here from the Zero Project Conference 2022. 
Uh, this was the fireside chat about global symbols, and please tune in for the other channels as well. Thank you, and stay tuned. Bye-bye.